Hey everybody, how's it going? I am your host Adrian, coming to you almost live from lovely Petaluma, California, here in Studio MC2 at Quicksurf Internet Studios. The Geekinator is a proud member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. Do feel free to head on over to techpodcast.com and check out all the other technology-related shows over there as well. I'd like to encourage everybody to visit us online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. And for those of you who have who have subscribed, thank you uh, for uh, supporting the show. And with that, let's go ahead and get into some of the get into some of the cool stuff that we've got for this episode. Starting off over at CNET or news.com, uh, Samsung has debuted the world's first curved display smartphone. So it is called the Galaxy Round. It's a flexible smartphone with an HD Super AMO LED display that is said to curve to the contours of a person's face. Um, pretty interesting. They're the first phone manufacturer to launch a flexible smartphone. Um, basically, it was announced late Tuesday evening. Uh, it incorporates the latest and flexible screen technology along with other unique features. It resembles a Galaxy S4, but it has a slight dip in the middle that causes the phone to curve along a vertical axis. It's plastic, so it doesn't exactly flex or blend, bend, but rather curves to the contours of the face. So basically, it looks like it's curved, uh, not quite that severe if you're watching the video, but it's it's you know it's got a curve. So when you hold it, it curves to your face. Uh, it's a 5.7 inch HD super AMO LED display. It's 7.9 millimeters thick and weighs 154 grams. So uh, basically it's a giant phablet, which makes sense that they would make it slightly curved because at that point it's getting large enough to where you feel like you're holding the plate against the side of your head. So should be pretty interesting. From Bloomberg.com, Amazon has won a ruling for a $600 million CIA cloud contract. We talked about this uh, before. Amazon uh, defeated the IBM effort to reopen bidding for a $600 million CIA cloud computing contract. Um, Judge Thomas Wheeler of the U.S. Court of Federal Claims in Washington granted Amazon's request for judgment on the administrative record following a hearing yesterday, according to a minute order posted on the court's electronic docket. A written opinion will follow according to the order. So uh, basically what happened is Amazon was originally awarded this contract and then IBM swooped in and tried to take it away from them. And Amazon ended up having to sue uh, saying we want it fair and square. And so this upholds uh, the original decision to go with Amazon for that contract. From The Verge... Apple is going to host an iPad event on October 22nd, according to All Things D. Now, we've been uh, expecting an Apple event in October. You know, obviously, they, in the last event that they did in September, they unveiled uh, new iPhones with iOS 7. The expectation now is uh, a month later, they're going to do the rest of their iOS devices, which is new iPads. One of, One event is kind of too much to release during one event and so they're kind of staging it out where they're all going to be available for the holiday season but you know they're they're kind of uh spreading it out a little bit um which is smart so new new ipads uh basically i'd expect their flagship ipad uh to continue to have a retina display maybe a larger version a 13 inch version I definitely expect to see the same processor, even maybe a, a more awesome, an awesomer processor uh, than what's in the 5S uh, in the new flagship iPad. Um, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they if they come out with an iPad that's a larger display, like a 13-inch display. So it would be more like a a, a laptop, a, you know, a mobile laptop replacement, like a MacBook Air replacement, uh, with a nice meaty 64-bit uh, quad core processor that's got you know like eight gigs of ram or something on it It'd be pretty cool if they did that i'd totally expect in the flagship ipad to see uh the fingerprint scanner um uh, you know upgraded internals maybe a new form factor what i'd really love to see is ipads come out in the same form factor 
as what their phones come out with. So the phones and the iPad form factors match, and the only difference is the size. Be pretty neat. Because that's one of my complaints uh, about the iPad is, you know, when you look at it, you know, it would be great if, because they're all iOS, so it would be great if they had the same form factor between all of them. So it should be interesting to see. Uh, I'd expect them to follow the same color scheme as they have on the 5S, uh, where you can get a space gray, silver, and a champagne or a gold colored iPad. One minute. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, so I there's already kind of uh, reports of that showing up. So it would be pretty neat if they did come out with, you know, basically a larger version of that. So an, an updated iPad mini, potentially with a retina display, I'd expect it to have a faster a processor, maybe the same processor that's in the iPhone 5C, not necessarily for the mini, uh, the same processor that's in the 5S, but definitely an update from what's in the mini now. Uh, the retina iPad, I would expect to probably stay the same form factor. Um, and really that uh, just, you know, basically it, what, it boils down to is, uh, you know, updated internals, potentially, uh, the same processor as what's in the five S fingerprint scanner, you know, that sort of thing, longer battery life, um, or a better processor. And then I would expect, or I would hope to see potentially if Apple knows what they're doing, uh, is a replacement mobile notebook iPad with a larger screen, like a 13 inch screen or 13.3 inch screen doesn't necessarily have to be a retina display, but it does need to be higher resolution than 1024 by 768. It'd be cool if it were 2048 by 1536, but uh, not really hold my breath about that. Um, that would be awesome if they came out with an iPad for that type of display uh, and gave it enough you know, battery life and enough meat and enough juice. If they could get it this thickness with a 13 inch display, they could fit a lot of battery in that thing. You could easily have all day battery usage, you know, LTE in there, more LTE bands, make it basically a world device, make that, you know, a lot of people can get by with that as their primary computing device. So anyway, there's lots of options. I'm curious to see uh, what they're going to do uh, about, uh, you know, with this. So it should be pretty cool. But yeah, there's always been an expectation that sometime in October, Apple will have an iPad uh, event from Gizmodo meet nests protect. It's a smart smoke detector. That's actually exciting. So nest thermostats, uh, you know, kind of took off. They've been really popular. Well, the, that same company is releasing what they call a protect and it's a smoke slash carbon monoxide detector. Uh, although it's a smart one, so kind of cool. Um, also, it's you know potentially going to be designed to work with the Nest. So if it does detect carbon monoxide, since the vast majority of carbon monoxide in the house is from the heater, it'll do things like shut the heat off, so it doesn't you know so you don't die. Um, it'll give you the opportunity to wave away a smoke detector or a smoke alarm. So let's say for example, uh, you accidentally just smoked some toast instead of blasting off the smoke alarm, it'll just say, "Hey, I'm detecting smoke." You know, if, uh, if this was a mistake or whatever, you can wave me away. Now, obviously if the smoke continues to get thicker and worse, it goes into a full on, there's a fire happening, but you're aware of it and, and it's at least communicating to you. I think it's kind of cool. Um, if you have multiple, uh, protects in your house, they can all communicate with each other. So they all go off at the same time in every room. Um, so should be pretty cool. It's got Wi-Fi in it. Uh, it'd be neat if they had a whole bunch of sensors in there, like if they put a temperature and humidity sensor and all that other stuff and all that could also talk to uh, the Nest. That would be pretty cool. And then what I'd love to ultimately see is they come up with a set of registers. So your, your AC registers or your heat registers come up with some registers that control airflow that also talk to the Nest or protects. And so if a room... You know, so that way, if you have one of these in every room, uh, you know, the, the, the house knows what rooms need more air and what rooms need less air, you know, having these sensors in every room. And so then as a result, they 
you know, kind of close down the, the vent in the rooms that don't need as much air and open up the vents in the rooms that need that need more air. And that way it allows them to equalize the temperature in all the rooms. That would be cool because then you start getting into zoning where you can say, well, you know, now I can start to have profiles where, you know, at night, this half of the house, you can pretty much just close the vents off and open these vents up wide open. And that way I'm only cooling or heating parts of the house, depending on, you know, what rooms are occupied at what times during the day. And if it comes with a motion sensor, you know, you can also then start to log, you know, roughly what rooms are occupied during what humans are, you know, humans are creatures of habit. (laughs) So, you know, it is in fact possible to, to monitor what rooms are occupied, you know, generally what times during the day and have those rooms at the temperatures that you prefer uh, at those times of day and basically just become a lot more intelligent and a lot more efficient about where you're spending your energy to cool or heat what rooms. So should be pretty interesting. Uh, I'm curious to see ultimately where this goes. You know, it looks like they've kind of got a pretty good idea of, uh, you know, home automation type stuff, make it, you know, real easy that, you know, know, that's basically it. It's like, look, if you can get one of these in every room and they can all talk to each other and they can all, you know, get the temperature in each of the rooms and all that other stuff. And they have motion sensors. So they know approximately when those rooms are occupied, uh, you know, you can start to apply a little bit of intelligence and really get start becoming more intelligent about where and when you spend energy to cool or heat a structure. Okay, enough of that. So from makezine.com, there's a Lego Adventure Time BMO and it features a Raspberry Pi. Uh, it's a spot on recreation of Adventure Time's BMO character. It's the work of Michael Thomas. It's basically a Raspberry Pi uh, Model B running a 2.5 inch TFT display. Um, obviously, it cannot make toast or skateboard like the real BMO, but uh, it's it's you know the enclosure is made out of uh, Lego bricks. It looks pretty cool. Definitely check it out if that's something you want to recreate yourself. From Hack a Day, homemade CNC reuses printer parts. Do-it-yourself CNC machines can never can be never ending projects. Once you get one machine done, you want another. Uh, so basically, um, the maker two, uh, is a successor to the maker one. And he's basically reusing parts from printers to, to make this. It's kind of cool. Um, they don't really have a YouTube video, but there's some pictures. Definitely check it out. If you're looking to do your own homemade CNC machine, you know, basically it's a movable head. That's got a Dremel, attached to it and you have you know there's a fair amount of calibration you have to do to get it to work but still pretty neat from gizmodo this is kind of an older story that i've been holding on to but i figured i'd bring it up now because it's pretty cool uh it's entitled uh, 36 gigapixel image captures ancient petroglyphs in texas uh the work of photographer mark willis combines advanced imaging and fabrication technologies with archaeological exploration often producing breathtaking images 3D models, and highly accurate virtual environments from ancient sites in the U.S. Southwest. His blog, sadly, not updated since 2011, includes references to polynomial texture mapping for reconstructing abandoned villages. Uh, There's an exhaustive step-by-step guide for using point clouds and landscape models, a how-to guide for making 3D printed replicas of ancient artifacts, and even using structure from motion analysis for measuring the deterioration of a rock art or of rock art over time. He's got some pretty awesome pictures, uh, and basically, you know, a giant pole that he goes and has a fairly high resolution camera. That's, you know, 20 or so feet above the ground. And he basically just takes a bunch of pictures, you know, in succession. And then there's some software that stitches it all together. Pretty neat. Definitely check it out. That will do it for this edition of the geekinator. As always, everything we've talked about is linked up in the show notes. Uh, You can check those out online over at quicksurf.com. Please do subscribe to the show if you have not already done so. And with that, I will see all of you on the next episode. I'll see you then. Bye.